Welcome to our next lecture on operating systems. Today we are going to talk about threads. So as an extension to our last long discussion of Unix style process management, we'll talk about alternatives today. And since the last lecture was quite extensive already, we'll uh, make it a bit shorter today and provide some examples that might be interesting to you if you want to dig a bit deeper. So first let's review what we did in Unix to enable fast process creation. So we've seen that for traditional Unixes that didn't have support by an MNU, we needed to copy the whole address space over if we used fork to create a new process. And this took a lot of time, especially it was a waste of time if the program that executed fork immediately calls one of the exec system calls or library functions after creating the child process in the child process to just not only create a new process, but a new process running a different program. And our historic solution for this was to use the vfork system call. So vfork used a trick by influ influencing the scheduler of Unix. So it ensured that as long as the child didn't execute an exec system call or terminated using the underline exit system call, the parent process was suspended. So there was no opportunity for the parent process, because it could continue running after fork, to change anything in the child process. And as soon as the child process calls exec, well, its complete address space is replaced anyways by new contents. So no need to make a copy before, or if it just uses exit because, for example, our exec system call failed because maybe we were not permitted to execute the program that was the parameter of exec. Then we can just use underline exit, just terminating the process without doing any cleanup tasks. So using vfork, the child simply used code and data of its parent without making a copy. And this required that the child process did not change any data. The parent process was unable to change any data after the fork because it was suspended until the child process called exec for exit. And sometimes this is not so simple. For example, if you call exit as the C library function instead of underline exit, the system call, then maybe your open files would be closed also in the parent process because you shared them. And then, well, you might have pretty unexpected behavior. And the hardware supported modern solution to this was using so-called copy on write supported by the memory management unit. So as long as no writes occur, the parent and the child process share the same code and data segment. So the MMU sets up links to the same physical memory pages for the parent and the child process. And it ensures that neither the parent nor child can write to these. So it sets the appropriate permissions to read only. And as soon as a write operation in the parent or child occurs, then only this, for example, for kilobyte memory page, is copied over to the address space of the parent or child process that just tried to write into it. So that takes quite some time because this requires a trap to the kernel. The kernel has to figure out what's going on, has to handle this, has to copy this for kilobyte page, has to change the MMU page table entries, and then let both continue. But this is still more efficient, especially for large processes, than copying the whole address space in the beginning. So uh, this works pretty well, especially when we're just using exec right away after the fork in our child process, because then, well, we don't write anything in our child process and exec can immediately replace the child's address space by the new program's contents. Uh, and it was found out that using a fork implementation using the MMU and copy on write is almost as fast as the fork and it makes programming quite a bit easier. But the question is, can we do even better? Because still we have to copy the MMU page tables to the new process. We have to copy all the contents of the process table, for example, yeah, open files, uh, memory pages that are used and so on. So uh, the question is, can we be more lightweight? Why do we call it lightweight? Well, there's an informal description of the size of a process context 
and we simply call it the weight. So the heavier a process is, the more overhead it takes for the system to administer it, to create a copy of that process, or yeah, to uh, simply switch between processes. So accordingly, this process weight is an indicator for the time that we need to do a context switch, because this context switch does, among other things, scheduling of the CPU, it needs to save the complete context, and it needs to load a new context. So especially saving and loading these contexts can take quite some time. And these classical Unix processes we create using fork are what we call heavyweight processes. And this doesn't matter if we use copy on write or not, we still have to go through the kernel for all these operations, which is quite costly. So an alternative was introduced relatively soon, and this alternative uh, is usually called lightweight processes or threads. So with processes we've seen there's a one-to-one -one relation between a control flow and an address space. So inside of a traditional Unix process we are having one program counter. This program counter runs through a single, single threaded program and executes, well, whatever is defined in the program. And uh, this is even true for fork processes. So this fork process has its own control flow and essentially its own address space. Even when using copy on write, it's just an optimization that creates the illusion that both processes have their address space in uh, separately, though they initially have it in common. And then this illusion is maintained by creating copies on demand using this copy on write. Now, an alternative is to have several flows of execution inside of a single address space, and that's what we call threads. So these threads share quite a bit of the process context. So our code, so they're running on the same code. They share the data and BSS segments, so our global variables. They share our heap, so everything allocated using malloc. But the only thing they do not share is the stack. Why can they not share the stack? because each thread has an independent flow of control, so it has its own yeah, location in the program where it's currently executed. It has its own call hierarchy, so which functions have called which other functions. And all of this information, including local variables, return addresses, and so on, needs to be stored separately on the stack for each execution context. So what's the advantage of doing this? Well. We don't need to fork a new process because we're staying inside of the same address space. So there's no need to do any copy operation, not even of the metadata for code, data, BSS, and heap. We just have to set up a new stack pointer, which is quite efficient because it's just a processor register. And this can be used, for example, if we have a parent thread and this uh, takes requests from the internet and this thread can just easily and rapidly spawn so-called helper threads, which might already be set up and running in the background to handle requests, for example, some user requesting a web page from our web server, and this can reduce the latency, so the response time of our web server significantly. So here's a typical example, a web, a web server that's using threads. So essentially requests come in over the internet using a TCP connection, and these accepted requests from the queue, so the main server thread or process takes them one by one from the queue, and instead of handling them itself directly, it just distributes them to worker threads. So there's a pool of worker threads, so in our example here three, and this S-shaped symbol is usually the symbol of a thread, and this pool of worker threads actually has some indication which of these threads is currently still yeah, answering one of the requests that came in, which of those is currently unused. But since they're unused, they don't use many resources since they share most of the address space of uh, all the other threads and the main server process. So the main server process can figure out whenever there's a new worker uh, thread ready, just hand over this new request to this worker thread, and then the main server process can already go on and take the next request from the queue, hand it over to another free worker thread and so on and so forth. So programs that consist of independent control flows, like this web server that just serves whatever is requested, a picture, an HTML page, and so on, 
They can immediately benefit from multiprocessor systems because we can assign each of these worker threads here to its own CPU, for example. So when it's running in the background already, we don't need to do a very expensive CPU scheduling. We already have it running. We just need to kick it off to activate it. And we have a fast context switch between all these threads here because there is no need to copy the address space. We can already pre-allocate these threads and then we only have to switch CPU uh, registers and especially the stack pointer because as we've seen, each thread requires its own stack. So that a couple of CPU registers and the most important here is of course the stack pointer. Threads unfortunately come with a number of disadvantages. So sometimes, especially at the beginning, they feel very difficult and error prone to program. Uh, threads share global data and global code, so especially access to shared data between threads requires coordination and usually the operating system still has to schedule these threads, so there's still some overhead involved in thread creation. So let's take a look at some examples how threads are used in common operating system. Let's start with a Windows, a typical Windows system. So when we talk about Windows, we always mean the Windows NT derived versions you have now, so Windows NT 2007, uh, Vista 8, 10, whatever they are called, and not the older MS-DOS based Windows 95 or 98. These are not yeah, really uh, operating systems in the terms we, are want, we want to talk about in this course, because they're just based as a pseudo multitasking system on a single tasking MS-DOS infrastructure. So a process in Windows has global and static data, which is shared among everything that's contained in the process. Then it has a separate stack for each of the threads in our process. And then our code runs in several threads. So threads are already an intricate part of the execution context of a Windows process. And a process has to contain at least one thread. And it can, of course, contain multiple threads and each of these threads then share global and static data, so BSS data segments. They share the same code segment, but of course they run in different locations on the code, and each of these threads has its own processor stack, as we've already seen. So a Windows process provides an environment and an address space for threads, but the process itself has no execution context. So we need a thread to provide an execution context. Thus, the win Windows or Win32 process always contains at least one thread, and the thread in Windows is the unit executing code. And as we've seen, every thread has its own stack and CPU register set, especially the stack pointer and the program counter. And the scheduler in Windows allocates compute time to the threads. All threads in Windows usually are kernel-level threads, so they're scheduled by the kernel scheduler. Uh, there are obviously possibilities to build what we'll talk about in a minute, user level threads, so-called fibers, but these are not very common in Windows. So a common strategy, because threads still have some overhead for scheduling and so on, is to keep the number of threads low. So there are alternatives, even for uh, providing some uh, asynchronous functionality. So for example, if you usually would block on a request to read it from a file, and this is to use overlapping or asynchronous input-output functions, which are provided in Windows, which means you start an input-output function, like a read from a file, but this returns immediately, so it just notifies the kernel, okay, we want to read something from a file, then you can continue doing other things in your th uh, process or thread, and then when this I.O. operation is finished, you are notified by the kernel asynchronously, so you don't have to wait until this operation is finished, yeah, as soon as the data is ready. How does this look in Linux? Now, Linux was uh, following whatever was going on in Unix pretty closely. So in the initial versions of Linux in the early 1990s, Linux implemented our classical fork and exec based Unix processes. But of course, there were requirements pretty early on to implement thread functionality. And in the so-called POSIX standard, this is a uh, standard defining Unix functionality for all sorts of Unix systems. Uh, there's a thread library called simply the pthreads for POSIX threads library. And so Linux provided an implementation for this. Now, how can we actually create threads that are managed by the kernel? You can't do it using fork 
because fork creates a copy. So Linux introduced a new Linux specific system call and the system call is called clone. So this clone system call is passed some function. So whenever we clone our current process, we want to call a function with this. It gets its own stack pointer as we've seen. Then we can specify a number of flags that actually describe the clone behavior in detail and we can pass a number of arguments using another pointer. And depending on our flags that we pass here, this universal function clone is parameterized. So for example, if you pass an option clone VM, and these options are usually just yeah, numbers uh, that can be ORed together, so essentially a bit string to indicate different parameters that can be set at the same time. So clone VM indicates to the kernel, please, if you clone this process, use a common address space for both. And then you can clone FS, so share information about the file system. We can also decide to have a different view of the file system for a clone. Clone files means share file descriptors, so which files are currently open. And you can also share things like signal handler tables. We'll talk about signal handlers later in this course. Now, if you looked at Linux systems early on, like until kernel version 2.2. something, uh, you, were, uh, you were a bit surprised because when you wrote a program using pthreads and you created a number of pthreads, all these threads showed up as separate processes, which is a bit strange because, yeah, we had this distinction between threads and processes before, and now Linux just implements this uh, identically. Yes, Linux has a bit of a different concept to traditional Unix systems, so Linux really treats all threads and processes internally as so-called tasks, so it doesn't differentiate initially between them, but it just detects using these parameters for clone which behavior is expected of different tasks. But the schedule, which is responsible for scheduling processes as well as threads, does not differentiate between those, so life for our scheduler was made a bit easier. So when you originally looked at an old Linux system, you really saw something like this on the right-hand side. So here we compile a multi-threaded program called threadpit.c, give it an output name of threadpit, and to use pthreads, you have to link the pthread library using the dash l parameter. And we don't show the source code of this. If you're interested, you can read it in, in the book referenced here. So uh, if we call this program and put it in the background using your shell, and then use the ps tool. So ps is uh, the Unix tool to display process information. Sh it's short for process state. We've already seen Unix developers are pretty lazy when it comes to typing. So they always abbreviate everything. And then you see we have three things called thread pit. So, uh, and each of these has its own process ID. This was a bit strange and that confused a large number of people. So more recent Linux systems, starting from kernel 2.4 in the, well, uh, probably uh, early 2000s, uh, still behave like this internally, but they no longer show these separate processes when we use another parameter to our clone system call, and this parameter is used as called clone thread. So essentially, if we pass clone thread to our clone system call as a parameter, then the child is placed in the same so-called thread group as the calling process. So this is treated as one of the threads of the process. So when you take a look at the PS listing for a multi-threaded program on a modern Linux system, you only see one process entry and not the single threads of a process. And this is important because what happens if you try to kill one of these threads here using a process ID, so you can just try to use the kill command to kill it, well, it needs to kill all the other threads. And this is not logical if you just understand Unix processes and don't know what's going on in detail, that when you kill one of them, all of the other thread pit processes, or threads in this case, would disappear. Now, the question is, can we be even more lightweight? And yes, we can. There's another concept called fibers, or they're also called user level threads, or in Java semantics, it would be green threads. Some systems call them featherweight processes. So again, we're reducing the weight of processes. We're slimming them even further. So the major overhead we have now when considering threads is that threads still have to be scheduled by the operating system. And fibers, uh, yeah, 
just use uh, something else. So the fibers decide to do all the scheduling on the application level, so inside of a single process. So a process can consist of several fibers now, uh, which the operating system doesn't know anything about. So for the operating system view, it's just one single big process. So uh, essentially this means that if you try to schedule such a process as the operating system, you schedule all of its threads just because, yes, uh, the operating system doesn't know what's going on. So there must be some trickery going on in user space to actually implement this switching of our execution context, of our process counter, and so on. And this is usually implemented using a library. There are several, and we'll take a look at, at one specific for these uh, in a bit. Uh, this is usually called a user-level thread package. Now, using fibers has a number of advantages. So the context switch is extremely fast because it's something like a go-to. So we just jump to a different location inside of our process. So this means we maybe only exchange processor registers, and that's it. So we don't have to wait for the kernel to schedule something. There is no expensive switch from user space to kernel space and back. But we're just, yeah, using a jump instruction on machine language level to go to another location inside of our text segment. And this means, well, uh, every application can choose to use this because the OS doesn't have any influence on this. So every application can choose a fiber library that's best suited for it. And there are several different libraries, for example, for Java, as we've seen, uh, there's one implemented by Mozilla for the Firefox browser and so on. But there are a number of disadvantages. One big disadvantage is if a single fiber in our user level, fibers or threads, is blocking, well, then, of course, the whole process is uh, put into the blocking state by the Unix system, just because the Unix system doesn't know that there might be different control flows that can be chosen. So we need to do something about this. And usually there's no speed advantage from using multiprocessor systems because the scheduler schedules a single process on a single CPU. So uh, yeah, a process using fibers would be unable to take advantage of multiple processes. So this whole user level process thing is based on what some people uh, think of a pretty bad hack. And this bad hack was already introduced some, sometime in the 1970s at Bell Labs by a, a guy named Tom Duff. And Tom Duff was writing device drivers. So actually pieces of operating systems code that transfer data usually from an IO device to main memory, or in this case from main memory to an IO device. And so this IO device on a PDP-11 system had the task of, I think it was a printer or something, copying 16-bit un unsigned integers. So in C notation, this would be a short, short, this is a short notation for short int. And this should be copied from an array into a memory mapped output register. So the idea was to have an array of 16-bit values and copy these values one after the other into a single memory location. And as soon as a new value showed up at this memory location, for example, our printer printed this as a character. And so if you want to implement this originally, you do it like this. So there's a send function here, which gets two pointers, two, uh, yeah, first an array. Uh, no, the second one is an array here. So our source from, which is just a pointer to the start of an array. The second one is a single memory location. This is the memory location of our device. So essentially there's a specific memory location where there's no main memory but there is a device attached. So whenever you write to this address, the device intercepts the success and, well, for example, takes the value and prints it. And there's a number you pass that indicates how many of these 16-bit unsigned integers you want to copy. And so you start with a loop, you assume that there's a count larger than zero, and then you dereference your pointer to the array. So you start with the address of from, you dereference it, so you read the first array element, you increment the pointer here using the plus plus operator, and you take the dereference value and copy it, also using a dereference here, to our device location. So in this line here, from is address to the memory, so from is the memory address, the pointer, then the memory is read, the copy 
is passed to whatever is in memory location 2, so our device usually. And at the same time, after reading from, our pointer from is incremented. And remember our C crash course, so when we implement a pointer to a basic data type like short, then it increments the pointer always by the size of the underlying data type. So here from is incremented by 2 because the size of a short is 2. And you run this do while loop well until our count is larger than 0 and this is already another C, C short count, uh, shortcut. This is a pre-decrement so before doing the comparison count is decremented by 1 and then we compare if there's still characters left over. Now this loop is perfectly fine and it works. Now the problem Tom Duff had was that actually uh, the device he was trying to communicate with was quite a bit faster than the CPU because, well, this is one operation here in PDP-11 machine code and this while loop means we have to decrement the counter, we have to compare it and in case the counter is larger than zero we have to jump back to the beginning of the loop to execute that single instruction again. So we're spending at least three instructions here so decrement, compare and a conditional jump to execute one instruction in the loop. So we're wasting a lot of CPU time. We're essentially executing four instructions for each loop iteration. And uh, Tom Duff was thinking about, yeah, can we have this faster? So reducing this overhead of always comparing a count, decrementing it and jumping conditionally. And the traditional optimization you do, and this is something a compiler would do nowadays, is to unroll the loop. So we rewrite our function. We have a new variable here. So this is a part of the original C code. So a register variable just means it's a variable that in back in the old days was directly kept in the CPU register because you want it to be fast. And this is just an integer. So whenever in this old C code there's no type, it's always assumed an integer. So this variable n is initialized to count divided by 8. So we divide count by 8 which means we only have one eighth of the iterations of the loop because we now compare n here instead of count and decrement it. So what we do now here inside of the loop, we replicate the loop contents eight times. So we copy from the address from, so from the initially from the first element in our array, increment the pointer and write it out. Then we point to our second element, our third element, fourth, five, six, seventh, and eighth element. And as long as we run through the loop, the next iteration would be on number nine, 10, 11, and so on and so forth. So we do eight copies per iteration, which remember is only one machine instruction. And then we still have our three instructions overhead. But now you see that the relation of useful, I'd say, instructions here, so which actually copy data to the device, to the overhead of our loop is much better because it's 8 to 3 instead of just 1 to 3. Well, and this uh, reduces the loop overhead significantly. So using this loop, our I.O. device could yeah, be provided data much faster. Now you might see that there's a problem because register n equals count divided by 8. And this is an integer division. So essentially, uh, if we had something like 17 iterations, well, 17 divided by 8 using an integer uh, division would just be 2. And the rest of 1, but the rest is not delivered anywhere. So essentially, this unrolled loop would actually copy only 16 instead of 17 shorts to our device. So some data would be missing. And of course, this is unacceptable. So the question is, what can you do? The usual thing you do is to just add some code, an extra do or for loop at the end that takes the rest of this division here and then executes the remaining uh, copies in a separate loop. Now this is again overhead, which we don't want to have. So what Tom Duff did is he really wrote some horrible C code. And please, please don't write code like this. But I think if you're uh, attending an operating systems course, you should have seen code like this before. So instead of unrolling the loop this way, now we calculate n as count plus 7 divided by 8. So essentially we ensure 
that we have all the complete iterations of our loop here by adding seven. So uh, now uh, there's a trickery. So essentially what you see here, these copy operations look the same. But there's some strange thing going on on the left hand side here. And this is, uh, yes, something that's actually well at C, which you wouldn't be, you wouldn't expect. So essentially what it, uh, what Tom Duff does is he now uses a switch, so essentially a case operation that can switch between different values of now our modulo, modulo values. So it takes the rest of the division of count by eight, as we've seen these were the missing iterations, and depending on this rest, it jumps somewhere. So if count is evenly divisible by eight, well, then our rest is zero. So we execute our do loop as before. And this is a specialty of the C case statement that there's a so-called fall through. So essentially in a case, when you execute something like this, you automatically continue to execute that one and that line and that and so on and so forth. And then you end up at our bottom of the while loop and jump back to the beginning. So this would be our normal loop as before. Now what happens if count is not evenly divisible by eight? Then we have a rest here, so one to seven obviously, because that can be the rest that shows up in this division here. And depending on the value of this rest, we jump over the start of our loop. For example, if the rest is seven, we execute the first, second, third, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh copy operation here, always incrementing our pointer. And then using this while loop, well, it still jumps to the beginning of the matching do. This is pretty crazy, but it works. And you can see, for example, if we only have two elements as the modulo, so we have, for example, 18 elements to copy, and uh, so we have two left over as the rest of our division, then we only have two copy operations, and then we start our do loop here from the beginning uh, as, uh, as we've seen. As I said, please don't write code like this. If you know your code works and you have this automatically generated, then you can benefit from this behavior because you don't have to execute a separate loop. You just execute the precise number of additional instructions required without a loop, so reduce the overhead significantly. Well, this can still be used if it's done in a controlled way to implement a multi-threading library. And one example for implementing fibers, so user-level threads, is proto-threads. So proto-threads are threads that are actually stackless. So they operate on the same stack for all the threads. They're very, very lightweight. So essentially the original proto-threads implementation just uh, consisted of a single C header file using a number of tricky defines. And these stackless lightweight threads are also co called coroutines in the literature. If you use uh, something like the Go programming language, you've maybe seen something like Go routines. So Go routines are the, uh, some sort of coroutine concept implemented in the Go language. So coroutines provide some blocking context cheaply using very minimal memory per proto thread. So this was built by Adam Dunkels in the uh, term of his PhD thesis at the Swedish Institute of Computer Science uh, in the early 2000s essentially, and he earned uh, the EURASYS PhD thesis award for this actually. So this was qu quite interesting work, actually inspired by this Duff's device stuff. And this was built for microcontrollers like AVR microcontrollers. So essentially where you only had very, very minimal amount of memory, so a couple of hundred or thousand bytes. So you couldn't spend lots of context on each thread, but you wanted to have some sort of threading abstraction without using a full featured operating system. There's some other related approaches which are interesting to read because they describe a bit of the history and the development of yeah, user level threads, very simple level threads in C in this literature reference, which is interesting to read. So it's just a web page here. So this on the left hand side here is a proto threads example. So it defines an example proto thread which gets passed a structure pointer to a proto thread structure. Then we tell our proto thread library, okay, we want to begin something. And then we have an endless loop here and this loop well, initiates I.O., it starts a timer, and then it does a PT wait until the I.O. is completed or we have a timeout of our timer. So either in either case, well, if I.O. is completed or we have a timeout, then we read our data and then we can continue. 
Now this at first looks like polling a device. So PT wait until would mean, oh yes, now we're blocking. So what have we won here? Now ProtoThreads proto is very tricky in this implementation because it uses something very similar like this. So it starts PT begin, implements a switch statement. This switch statement goes uh, over the LR variable of our PT struct. So this is essentially our line we are uh, writing at, uh, LC, sorry, line count. So each of these lines has a single line number. And if you use GCC or Clang, so a modern C compiler, you can actually get the line number of such an instruction using the underline, underline, line, underline, underline, preprocessor macro. So this is not available in the C standard, but this is an extension by GCC and Clang. And so uh, if we use a function like PT wait until, then, well, we set the line counter here to our current line and add a case statement to the switch that was yeah, added here at the front and, well, case line. So if we're at that line again, that's perfect. And then we return. So PT wait until C is our condition here, which we pass. So it's IO completed or timer expired. So if this condition is not valid, we would usually block. And here we don't block, but the thing we do is return from this function here. So essentially we are kicked out of example. So our PT thread library can now jump to a different function, implementing a different thread, but we're still inside of our switch context. So when we return to our proto thread, to our function implementing that proto thread for the next time, we start from the beginning here, obviously, but there's a switch statement and we've just changed this the last time we exited the function. So our function now remembers the line where we've been. So essentially, instead of blocking here, we just returned from the function then our proto-thread library can do something else. And whenever our proto-thread library decides to return to our PT thread, then our switch here takes the memory, uh, the line number we remembered from our previous execution of that function here and directly jumps to this case statement here. So this is essentially the same thing that's happening in a some, some, uh, some way simpler form in Duff's device. So this is to show you some neat or nasty, depending on your view of it, tricks. Please note you don't have to really understand all of this, what's going on here. But I know some of you would love to have a challenge, and this is a nice challenge for your C knowledge. Try to write a program in proto threads, expand the macros here, try to see what comes out of it, try to understand the switch statements, and then, yeah, probably you'll want to program in a different language afterwards, maybe because C can sometimes be very cruel like this. But of course you don't have to use this. The advantage really for the user is the user only has to write code like on the left hand side here with valid abstractions here and what's going on, this magic here on the right hand side as encapsulated in the library, ready for you to be used. So to summarize, let's look at processes versus threads versus fibers. So processes have separate address spaces, whereas threads and fibers have a common address space Processes and threads are visible to the kernel and accordingly they are scheduled at the kernel level, whereas fibers are implemented in user space by using these neat tricks like yeah, a go-to using the switch or case statement in C uh, and then just jumping to the start of a loop again or even returning from a function again. So fibers are not visible in the kernel uh, and essentially uh, are not scheduled in user space as a consequence. In processes, you have a separate stack per process, obviously. In threads, you have separate stacks per threads. In fibers, as we've seen in the proto threads implementation, there is no stack management. We don't switch a stack pointer around. So the uh, stack can actually be common. And uh, essentially, uh, this means that our switching overhead for processes can be very high because we have to switch uh, yeah, MMU tables uh, and the uh, TLD, the translation local site buffer when switching processes. For threads, it's still high because we have to go through the kernel, even if we don't have to switch address spaces, so we don't have to switch MMU page tables. And for fibers, it's very low because, yeah, from the view of an operating system, fibers are just a single process, and whatever happens inside there stays inside there. So that's all for today. Uh, a conclusion is that we've seen traditional Unix process creation using fork, 
is too heavyweight for some applications, for example, a web server, like Google's web servers. I mean, they're, they're of course distributed over many computers, but still each of these machines uses threads to implement very fast response times because Google gets millions and millions of requests per second. And we've seen alternatives like threads on kernel level and fibers on user level. And we've also seen each of these solutions has its own advantages and drawbacks. So processes have some copying and scheduling overhead. Threads mean that synchronization of access to shared memory can be difficult to program. And fibers means there is no kernel management, so we can't use the uh, computing power of a multiprocessor. And if we block something, usually a fiber of a process blocks all fibers. And we have to use these mean tricks like we've seen in the Proto Threads implementation to get away with this. Uh, Linux has used the Unix process model exclusively for quite some time uh, and then added pthread support uh, in different ways. Uh, we've seen a bit of the evolution in there. Whereas Windows and T based systems didn't have to be compatible with anything, essentially they were compatible with an operating system that uh, one of the head developers of Windows NT developed before at a different company called DEC. This was called VMS. And if you look at VMS internals books, you'll find that there are very many similarities between VMS and Windows NT. And Windows NT didn't have to be compatible with Unix, so they could implement threads from the beginning. And this was also inspired by some research operating systems like the Mach operating system that was developed uh, at the Carnegie Mellon University, which is, for example, the basis of Mac OS X. So essentially, Mac OS X doesn't have a very traditional Unix kernel, but it uses a bit of a different approach and also a different approach to thread handling here. But we won't go into details on this. So this gives the references for today's lectures here. So here's a paper on how to do fine-grained parallelism if you have very complex tasks for a web server. This is uh, the paper by Adam Dunkels describing his proto-threads library. This is, well, the original Usenet posting by, by Tom Duff already like more than 30 years ago. Uh, this was a posting to the Usenet group Complex C. So Usenet was or still is, well, uh, a, a forum system. So something like Reddit, but more civilized with, uh, yeah, a text-based interface and no nasty JavaScript and app stuff. Uh, this still exists, but uh, only probably used by, well, some, some old timers like me. <laughs> And so you can find a copy of this posting at this address uh, from colleagues uh, in Sweden. Uh, there's this page by Simon Tatham on coroutines and in C, which gives some more implementation details. Uh, there's information on how threads worked in Linux before in this old book on advanced Linux program from 2001, uh, which describes the old behavior of pr uh, threads showing up as separate processes in Linux. And then there's a description of the implementation, also quite a couple of years old, of the native POSIX thread library by Ulrich Trepper and Ingo Molnar uh, to be found at that URL. So I hope you got a bit of an insight into how threads work and what fibers are and all of the nasty tricks you can use in C to implement stuff like this. Uh, I hope you found it interesting. Uh, so thanks for listening and until next time. Bye.